This subject was suggested to me and I thought it was too interesting to pass up, so I paused what I was doing and started to focus on this. Thank you for the suggestion. It is likely that you may have discovered my channel from one of my nuclear disaster videos. This story is most definitely not the deadliest I've covered in terms of environmental impact, however it deserves to be remembered, as it was the only nuclear reactor incident in the US that resulted in immediate deaths, with one of the fatalities being impaled by a shielding plug to the ceiling. The SL-1 was an experimental nuclear reactor and stood for Stationary Low Power Reactor No. 1. The idea for the reactor was part of a series of experimental nuclear power plants for use in remote radar outposts in the Arctic, where the only power source had been from diesel generators. The Army had been evaluating their use of diesel generators between 1954 and 1955 and decided on a more effective replacement. The Army Reactors Branch contacted the Argonne National Laboratory who had a proven track record in reactor development on the Manhattan Project to design, build and test a prototype reactor. The Army has set out a shopping list of requirements for their new low power reactor. Some of the more important attributes were simple and reliable, easy to build, operable in a harsh Arctic environment, must be air transportable, all components limited to package sizes measuring 2.2 by 2.7 by 6 meters, and no heavier than 9.1 kilos to use minimal proprietary parts and finally each core loading to have a three year life cycle. The prototype would be built at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho Falls, Idaho, which was pretty isolated, with ground being broken in July 1957. After a year almost to the day, July 1958 saw the construction complete and going critical in August and finally up and running in November with it formally being opened on the 2nd of December. The reactor was held within a 15 meter high cylindrical building made out of quarter inch steel and was known as ARA602, with a condenser fan room near the top of the building. Access to the plant was via a door through an enclosed stairwell from ARA603, the support building. There was an emergency exit leading out to external stairs to ground level. The reactor was embedded in gravel at the bottom. The building didn't have the same protections as a plant in a built up area, but it was thought that any incident could be contained within the main structure. The reactor would use a boiling water design and used 93.2% highly enriched uranium fuel, which would use light water in a natural circulation cycle for cooling. The water system flowed through fuel plates of uranium aluminium alloy under a pressure of 300 pounds per square inch. The reactor was built to house 59 fuel assemblies, one source and nine control rods. However, in general operation, it only used 40 fuel and five control components. Many of the blank spaces used dummy rods, which were later fitted with test sensors. After testing, the reactor was handed over to the army for operation and training experience and Combustion Engineering Incorporated working as the lead contractor from February 1958. Many different personnel would train on the reactor from both military and civilian organizations, with the plant operated by two crew members with CEI staff monitoring any developments, being able to step in as necessary. As the reactor aged, boron strips corroded and flaked off, and by 1960 the CEI had calculated that 18% had been lost within the core of the reactor. In November 1960, cadmium sheets were added to try and bolster the corroded boron. Leading up to the Christmas on the 21st of December 1960, the reactor was shut down for maintenance for 11 days. During this time the instruments were recalibrated and extra auxiliary components were installed. Flux wires were also installed, these were used to monitor the neutron flux levels within the core. On the 3rd of January 1961, the reactor was being readied by a three-man team in preparation for it to be brought back online. Each man was in their 20s and consisted of Army Specialist John A. Byrons, Richard Leroy McKinley and Navy CB Construction Electrician, First Class, Richard C. Legg. 
As the team worked on the reactor, two false fire alerts would be triggered, both of which were responded to by the fire department. Part of the maintenance process meant that the main control rod in the centre of the core had to be withdrawn manually to be reconnected to its drive mechanism. As the evening drew in, all three men were inside the reactor room, with Byrons and McKinley at the side and legs standing on top of the structure supervising the movement of the control rod. At 1 minute past 9 in the evening, John Byrons withdrew the control rod too far, and within 4 milliseconds, the rod became critical, instantly creating enough heat to melt the fuel within the core, vaporising it. As the heat caused the fuel to expand, a pressure wave was ejected out of the reactor, creating a water hammer, which in turn lifted the whole reactor 2.77 metres in the air. Richard Legg, who was standing on top of the structure, became impaled to the ceiling by one of the shield plugs, which had been travelling at a speed of 26 metres a second. A high pressure spray of radioactive steam water hit the two men who had been working to the side of the reactor, killing Byrons instantly and severely injuring McKinley. From the control rod going critical to complete destruction only took between 2 and 4 seconds. Another fire alarm for the day was sounded and a slightly annoyed fire crew of six men turned up. At first it seemed like another false alarm with the main building intact from the outside, with only a little bit of steam emanating from the roof. However, as the crew moved towards the building and upon entering the stairwell, they found their radiation gauges were going haywire. The fire crew immediately retreated and after consulting with a doctor made a plan of spending no more than a minute for each person inside the structure to limit the exposure. Initially one crew member and a health physicist wearing protective equipment and gas masks attempted to enter the building, however they withdrew after seeing 25 rotogens on their radiation meters. At 10.30pm a supervisor working for the contractor CEI and the head health physicist arrived on the scene and entered the reactor building at 10.45. Two of the men were found soaked in radioactive water, with Byron's dead and McKinley slowly moving and groaning from a head injury. Prioritising McKinley, the rescue team focused on trying to save the injured operator, but with only one entry at one minute per person, it would take until 10.50 before they could successfully place him on a stretcher and remove him from the structure. McKinley would not regain consciousness and would succumb to his wounds at 11pm. Although dead, his body was still deadly, measuring gamma radiation at 500 rotogens an hour, even after being stripped of his contaminated clothing. It would take until 11.38pm for the discovery of the final victim, Richard Legg, whom had been impaled to the ceiling above their heads. After the discovery of all the victims, the rescue efforts slowed down as to protect the safety of the recovery team. The next night, Byron's body was recovered by a team of six volunteers. It wouldn't be until the 9th that an attempt could be made to recover Legg's body. The process to remove Legg's body would be practiced in the safety of the Dugway Proving Ground, as it would involve a 1.5 by 6.1 meter stretcher attached to a crane. This process would take 10 men, each working in intervals of 65 seconds, to pull Legg's body off the shield plug by using hooks on long poles. Eventually his body became free and fell onto the stretcher suspended from the crane. Originally it was thought that the disaster was caused by a chemical explosion, believing the reactor to be safe. However, a gold watch worn by one of the operators showed evidence that the buckle had reactive gold, and other items in the men's possession showed neutron activated elements. The bodies had to be treated as if they were nuclear waste due to their potential for polluting the environment, and were buried in lead lined coffins placed inside metal vaults, with some of the more radioactive parts being buried in the Idaho desert with other nuclear waste. The cleanup efforts would take 475 people 18 months. It was decided that to transport all the contaminated waste to the radioactive waste management complex 16 miles away would cause too much risk of radiation exposure as the journey would travel over public roads. Instead, a burial site was established 500 metres from the reactor. The first main hurdle was cleaning up the contaminated reactor room of all dangerous materials. Once this was done, a 60 tonne crane was employed to remove the reactor vessel from the building. As the reactor building was deconstructed, any contaminated materials got disposed of in the burial site. However, any parts of the structure and reactor core that would be needed in a later investigation were sent separately to the Aircraft Nuclear Program's Hotshot Inspection Centre, after which they were sent to the Radioactive Waste Complex. 
In total, after completion of the cleanup efforts in September 1962, 2,800 metres of dangerous material was placed in the burial site, up to a depth of 4.3 metres, with half a metre of clean soil placed above. The site is now known as United States Environmental Protection Agency Operational Unit 5-05. The cause of the incident would be a mystery over the following two years of the investigation. They knew the reactor went critical, but they didn't know why the control rod was pulled out so far. Maintenance procedures stated that the rod would only be needed to be manually moved 10 centimetres. However, it was estimated that Byron's actually withdrew it 66 centimetres, causing the reactor to go critical, setting off the steam and water hammer that would destroy the vessel. Much of the damage to the building and the impaling of leg was put down to the high pressure water jet initiated by the vaporised fuel. Using scratches on the control rods and analysing the newly installed flux wires, investigators managed to establish any movement under 58.4 centimetres of the rod would not have caused the reactor to go critical. However, it would have only taken Byron's 500 milliseconds to move the rod between 58.4 and the eventual 66 centimetres. Unfortunately, he had no time to correct his action. However, still a mystery was why the rod had been moved over the 10 centimetres needed in the first place. As there were no logs made during the process, some worrying theories were proposed. Here are the main theories from least to most likely. A suicide murder because of an affair with one of the other crew members' wives plain old suicide, sabotage, accidental withdrawal, and finally an attempt to make the rod travel freely within the core by working it backwards and forwards. There is some weight unfortunately behind the murder-suicide theories as Byron's and Legg were from the same training class and Legg had surpassed him becoming a supervisor and the 3rd of January was the first shift Legg had worked being in charge of his old classmate. Also on the day of the critical event, Byron's had been informed that his wife wanted a divorce. Whether an intentional mistake or not, it is not unthinkable to think that Byron's mind was not on the job at hand. The last theory is thought to be the most likely case as the design of the SL1 had an unwanted side effect, sticky control rods. This meant that over the three years that the reactor was operational, 40 events of a stuck control rod had been reported and the number had dramatically increased over the latter part of 1960 with four happening in the month leading up to the incident. It was thought that the reason for the problem of stuck control rods were caused by corrosion, clutch and drive bearing issues on the rotational assembly in the core, and a misalignment issue. The rod that went critical, number nine, was in the centre of the core. A bearing or clutch issue would be unlikely as sticking only occurred during rotation. This would affect the other non-central control rods more. Even though the cause was highlighted, the rapid removal of control rod number 9, the reason for the movement will likely still remain a mystery. The aftermath of the SL1 incident caused the design to be abandoned and for future reactors to not have the ability to go critical after the removal of just one control rod. Other low power reactors would be made during the Army Reactors Branches project. However, the outbreak of the Vietnam War would divert Army resources, stopping the program in 1965. During the cleanup, around 790 people were exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. The area would be monitored for decades to come. 32 workers would receive commendation for heroism for their role during the recovery and cleanup operation. It is lucky that the reactor was situated in a relatively isolated area and the building itself did well to contain a lot of contaminants. However, in 1995, the Environmental Protection Agency recommended a cap be built over the burial sites as these were still hot spots of radiation. The cap was made out of local rocks and rubble and was completed in 2000. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Do you have any suggestions for future videos? Let me know in the comments below. Help the channel grow by liking, sharing and subscribing. If you'd like to support the channel financially, I also have a Patreon and the link is in the description. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.